you guys want to open it up to discussion about like, I mean, we could we could try yeah. and address these questions, which is something that um, that we've been asked to do every workshop, and we're going to bring it back in the closing um, for each workshop. What these questions, the answers to these questions were. Um, so, do you guys want to do that? Answer the questions. Yeah. Can we just go around the circle? Yeah. Totally. Um, Asa, uh, Dice so Lessers, the Students Project. Hi, I'm Devin. Should I say where I'm from? Yeah, uh, if you want, I mean, you have, we've already talked, so if you want to like say a little bit about your organization. Or okay, um, I'm involved in a lot of things. <laughs> um, my name's Devin. I, I'm a senior at Western New England University in Springfield in the social work program. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm heavily involved with the community in Springfield, and I actually would like to stay after and talk to some of you about some advice because. Springfield is extremely polluted and mm -hmm. we're trying to do things. Um, I'm with Arise for Social Justice. It's a community organization where, and they're trying to create a global climate um, change plan. I, I'll talk about it after, but, um, and then I also, I'm also involved with, um, I do things with Neighbor to Neighbor in Springfield and um, I'm kind of involved with SEIU because they collaborate with I'm Joel. I uh, work with Clean Water Action in the, out of Boston. Um, I work on our energy campaigns, uh, so I do a lot with uh, coal-fired power, for example, which if, um, in, in the Massachusetts area, that's Holyoke, Salem, and um, Somerset, which is the Providence area, very hard, actually. Um, uh, I do some other work with, through a lot of the groups that are present today, we have some, some uh, solidarity in between unions and community groups um, in energy weatherization. Um, you heard from uh, ADP, so Tim Fisk that, and, and Boone, who's, who's um, hosting, they, they do a lot of work for that in uh, the Springfield Western Mass area. Um, and we have a kind of statewide coalition there. Um, I also, I live in Dorchester. Um, and so for the, the aspects of things that I don't work on my paid work, um, uh, you know, I'm on the board of a, we're founding a food cooperative. We're trying to address healthy food access. Um, I live, like, we have, like, horrible traffic pollution. Um, we have tons and tons of auto shops that, like, some of the, in, in the nail salons that are not necessarily using the cleanest chemicals. And But some of them are, like, you know, one or two of the auto shops, for example, are, are really um, trying to green their business and have something that's, like, that works for everyone. So there's some green and solid air. I love I love the um, the, the van the, the bus, the bus. Yeah. Uh, uh, is traveling around that's just awesome. Um, hi, I'm Emily Barnett. I work at Pernay Family Health Service, uh, which is an agency nonprofit agency in the Green Island neighborhood in Worcester. I do live in Maine South, about two blocks from here. Um, I basically run the all youth programming out of the agency for after school homework help and socialization for middle school students to um, youth gardening during the summertime. And we have a small business in the summertime. My youth sell small planters, uh, cement planters, to local businesses, and then we maintain them for the businesses and keep the neighborhood clean. So it's a way to make the neighborhood beautiful as well as gain funding so we can uh, buy the seeds and material we need for our own uh, vegetable garden, which we give out in our food pantry. Um, and I have to say, I also really like your bus idea. Um, my youth programs have gotten very large in the last two years, and we have no way to go on trips at all. And so, like thinking about, you know, what are some solutions to that? Um, I'd love to touch base with you guys about, like, you know, you're trying to make a cooperative, and that's something that I'm actually working towards here in the city for local um, nonprofits to do after-school programming and doing buses to the youth. Are we gonna have like time to walk to the bus? Yeah, over lunch. Over lunch. Yeah, okay. yeah, we parked right outside. If anyone wants a ride, we can take it <laughs> <laughs> three blocks down the road. Cool. I'm Ashley. I'm um, living in Providence right now, and I'm really interested in this. I actually just saw the bus for the first time last week when it was transporting bands from mm. the prong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, finally I get to see it. It was really cool. Um, and I am involved in Providence to start up a pedicab cooperative, so I'm doing mm. A different form of green transportation now. It's a bike taxi service, and um, I'm a worker owner, so all the workers own the co-op. And right now, we just do transportation for people, going around to events and stuff, and we do CSA delivery, so we're delivering vegetables from local farms to people's homes. Um, 
So that's my new project, and it's really exciting to be part of Solidarity Economy that way and thinking about how I, like how to work together and how to use our business as like a resource in our community. How we can use to and like one thing we want to do is like transport people in marches and parades, like people who couldn't normally participate and be able to do that um, without charging, like to be a part of a movement and be, be present in that. Um, and the other thing I work on is Ciclo Vida, which is international solidarity for small scale farmers. So we do a lot of work on, um, I guess, like exposing what industrial agriculture does to our communities and to our food sources and working on building a network of support for people who do small scale agriculture and grow organic and grow without genetically modified foods um, and sharing the skills of saving seeds so we can all be autonomous in our food production and have our food grow locally and healthfully. Wait, what do I say? Whatever you want. Um, my name is Kendra. Oh, I'm a student. <laughs> I'm a student with Ego Youth, so um, I participate there, and I did um, CEC over the summer. <laughs> I'm Julian. Uh, you already heard from me. So I'll pass it on. I'm Carissa. You already heard from me. I'm Kiara, and I'm a student at the Ego Youth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chelsea, and I just moved to the states, so I'm finding like. I'm looking for ways to get involved because back home I did activism and stuff, but here I, I need to. So this is a good starting point for me. Ecuador. So would it be the best use of our time to maybe um, talk about how we can get involved in each other's projects? Like, do we have specific questions for each other around, <coughs> um, for example, that petty cat business or starting cooperative business and something? Yeah, I feel like, like, I mean, this is just an awesome place to make connections, like, to, to build the solidarity economy. Like, we don't need to teach you guys, you know. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Um, I'm curious, so this is, like, directed at Worcester, but also for other folks in the community. Um, just, like, how the different co-ops work together. Mm -hmm. um, you said you're in an organization that has three different co-ops. Like, are there ways you collaborate, or ways you share resources, or are there overlapping people and all of that? Like, yeah. how does how does that end up how you end up working together with people? It's pretty interesting. Um, like, uh, toxic soil busters and youth in charge, um, because they they do basically the same job. They have different um, places, uh, different workplaces. Uh, and of course, we, we do a lot of collaboration and, and like discussing with them. Every, like every week, you know, we're like, hey, what are you guys doing? What are we doing? And, and we share projects. Uh, and like with Future Focus Media, TSB and Future Focus share an office. Um, so we're always in the same place, always like intertwining ideas. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think, Gaysa? Like, well, um, that's interesting. We've been in the process of redefining our structure for the better part of, of a year now, yeah. and it's definitely very complex. We, I mean, I really what I really liked about the ADP presentation today was sort of confronting the difficulties and the challenges of working in that large nonprofit, and that's what really made that presentation uh, constructive for what we were thinking about in terms of, yeah, looking back at our structure. We don't have a lot of the problems that larger nonprofits have because we are smaller, but in the same way there are times when like we're pushed this way and that by spirit funding. So um, in terms of the relationship but between the cooperatives, one we definitely overlap in terms of personnel. For example, Matt works a lot uh, on the staff collective with Toxic Soul Busters, but also with Future Focus Media. I was a member of Future Focus Media. I've been doing less work with them and more with Toxic Soul Busters recently. And also like some, there are times when like YSC came and helped us do the landscaping job this summer. And more recently, we've been helping them incubate their snow, um, uh, snow shoveling business and uh, the and leafleting do, uh, business. And do a foodscape garden at yeah. Conley Village, um, which we started like about a month ago. And of course, like Future Focus Media came and yeah. organized this, even if it was like mostly talk to Soul Busters, me, Haley, and McCready that were most involved in doing this. So there's definitely those times when we can fill in for each other, but it's also interesting because we have. We all have separate meetings and we all make our decisions separately, but at the same time our budgets are intertwined and our marketing is intertwined, so a lot of our promotion materials have all our names on them and 
in the way that we like market ourselves, sometimes it's confusing. It's easy to like step on each other's toes, but I think it's it's an ongoing process. Yeah, I think so. What's the turnaround as far as you're, you're planting and you're trying to remediate the soil in an organic way? Yeah, so that's that's a really interesting um, part of toxic soil busters. It's so it's that's of course it started with the idea of phytoremediation, and it's right now we um, are we using phytoremediation anywhere? We're doing a little bit of experimentation. So the thing was, when we started talking so much, that was the big rush. That was the impetus. That there was this new technology. That there was they were testing in um, like Canada and a few other labs here that showed promising results. Yeah. And through our own experimentation at Stone Soup and a, a, a number of other sites, we sort of came to realize that it was it wasn't like the cure all that we had originally hoped it would be, and that we had to develop a more balanced approach where we would continue experimenting with these alternative um, solutions like phytoremediation, like mycoremediation, remediation with um, mushrooms, and also exploring these other not so used techniques like using um, dilution. Yeah, dilution or uh, using rock phosphate to bind with the lead so it's less bioavailable to create a pyromorphite, and all these different like cool uh, niche things that aren't being explored as much, so our uh, flexibility and our um, not being focused on like just the outreach side or just the um, profitability side allows us to explore. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when you have a yard with a child who plays in them that has lead soil, we can't always wait and do those kinds of long-term remediation tactics. And usually for relap, for our Worcester Lead Abatement Program projects, we have to do more like covering up with landscaping fabric, doing hardscapes over it, like stone or wood, um, doing, just trying to reduce, it, it is like a temporary band-aid, and obviously that more holistic healing of the earth using these deep uh, plant remediation is preferable, but oftentimes we have to deal with the immediate human impacts of poison in our communities, and that often means sacrificing these broader principles for the sake of uh, so, that. so like putting a physical barrier between the, the, the poisonous soil and, and the children that would come in contact with it. Um, then we do, of course, raise beds so that the families can um, grow their own vegetables still, um, grow their own food. Uh, yeah, this summer we, we built, <laughs> we just did so much in this one yard. It was the biggest yard. We did, like, patio, pea stone bed, perennials everywhere, half of the lawn with, with new soil and then regrassed another part of the lawn um, completely covered in mulch uh, in the front. We, we built two raised beds. Um, can you think of anything else? Sandbox, Sandbox. built the brick edging all around the edge brick and edge built that edging, with mulch yeah. and planted all new plants along the side. We did a lot of stuff. Like we did a um, stone bed for the um, back yeah. porch too. But yeah, to answer your question more specifically though, the turnaround, so when you plant the plants, mm -hmm. from what I've read of like research studies, not a lot of this is, this is a lot of this was research that was done before I joined on in the early years of TSB, but most of the benefits happen in the first year, but then also that long-term remediation is really needed, especially with high concentrations of lead. So there's a balance of like um, limited uh, effects in some circumstances and also um, really long-term uh, replanting and reseeding needed uh, to get those kinds of effects in other situations. What kind of time we have now? It's like, it's like how much time we have left? Lunch is, they're going to switch back in half an hour, so yeah. lunch is what? at like 1.30. Alright, oh, so we have another hour. Okay, <laughs> okay. cool. Okay. Let's get another time. I actually have a question um, for all of you lovely youth. Um, most of you, I'm guessing, are, are from the cities that you are, are now working in. And being in urban centers, I'm curious how you got into the environmental movement and why you found it was really important for you to be part of that and like kind of what was your driving factor for that? Oh, can I just go quick? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of forced, I'm going to be honest with you. I, tr I transferred high schools and um, I don't know if you ever heard of the Met High School, but they're very like experience based, like go into an internship, uh, we're going to put you into college classes and then um, before I fully transferred they were like, hey do this summer program 
some of your some of your uh, peers are gonna be in it, so that way you can make friends before you get into it. Mm -hmm. So then I did it, and then I met Amelia, and then I just so fell in love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can popcorn. Yeah, you can go. I'll go. I got started in 10th grade. In 10th grade, um, my school was Feinstein. It was a lot like the Met. Um, it was more about like community service and making sure that the community was like the youth got to work with the community. Um, but the way mine started was that we wanted to start recycling in my school. Um, and so, because they like sent out this thing where like all the schools got graded and we got like an F. And so my te one of my favorite teachers, she was like, all right, you guys, if you guys come and help start recycling, we'll get you pizza every single week. And we was like, okay, that's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we started and then um, we got in touch with Amelia from the Environment Justice League. Um, and she helped us with like recycling and so she had like the healthy corner store stuff going on too So she asked us to like be part of it with like an iron chef competition and like the youth got to like go in and um, Cook stuff from like it has to be they had to cook something healthy um, with, a budget, with a budget of ten dollars and they had to walk to a corner store to get the ingredients mm -hmm. um, And so through that she started telling us about eating healthy and so we stopped eating pizza every week and we got um, healthy food like we got like fruit every single week so we had a fruit salad um, and then she told us about um, the CEC and she was like oh if you guys want you guys could come do this and I then I just went with it and I just kept doing it ever since and sort of all happened really organically for me. Um, uh, I met Asa, right, and that was my introduction to Toxic Soil Busters. Um, but also, I had known about Worcester Roots Project uh, prior to meeting Asa uh, through my brother, Scott, who, um, who does Empower by the Deepa Co-op, uh, as well as you know, working with Worcester Roots Project. And he also works at Blank Slate, which you saw at the, uh, on the Club Canada video. Um, and so I suppose like I, I had heard about all of these things and um, always been very, very um, interested in uh, my impact on the environment and how I can change that for, for the better. Um, and the introduction to like, like my first job was, was an internship at, uh, at Worcester State University. It was a sustainability internship with Peter Cutting here. Um, and it was basically like research on and development in Worcester on like general things that we can do sustainably. So we, you know, we focused on solar and wind and recycling and just a million different projects at the same time, um, really doing research on them. That was my first job, and my second job was, I was working with a youth-run co-op that does lead safe mediation. So. Um, I guess I've always been interested. Like you know, it's, it's been it's been sort of innate Not for for me to love the environment and to want to help it. Um, and Talk to Soul Busters has really given me the opportunity to uh, be you know active in my community and to really be like such an integral part of, of this community organizing and solidarity <laughs> economy. I actually forgot to mention, the main Carissa forgot to mention, um, is that we like both got into it through the CC, um, but then the way we continued it, um, and this came on for like our, where the youth group came into play, was that we told um, Julian that it was like, oh, we do so much good stuff over the CC um, over the summer, but then we go to like our normal lives during the school year, and then it's like everything we do is only during the summer. We was like, we want something that we can like do throughout the year, so like that we're still like doing things. Um, and then we came up with Eco Youth. I came up with the name. Um, it's the Environmental Community Organizers. Um, and through that was where like now we have um, a summer thing where we do CC, and from the summer um, classes we get youth to get involved during the school year if they like liked it enough that they want to like do something. Um, 
So that's like another where like where we're at right now. That two weeks. How many kids? I mean, youth do you have in the C, uh, CEC right now? So like how Carissa said, first year started with like 15 students. Mm -hmm. The second year it was, was like 30 students. Because it was two classes. Because mm -hmm, it was two classes, and then the third year it was three classes, um, and each class had 20 students. Mm -hmm. Each class had 20 students. And then la um, the previous year, we noticed that although we had more students in the um, in like the previous year, we didn't get to meet every student didn't get to meet one another because there was the classes were so separated mm -hmm. that mm, there wasn't ever time for them to like ever meet until like the graduation where it was like nobody really kind of knows each other because <laughs> they're just like <laughs> separated and whatnot. Um, so this year, what we ended up doing was having three classes, and it was like forty. Just over between thirty and thirty-five total. All right, so thirty-five-ish. Yeah. Um, and so what we ended up doing was that they had to take a class like food justice or um, environmental justice, and the revolution one on one class is a class where both classes would meet inside of it. Okay. Um, and so like that we incorporated where they would meet. Cool. Cool. Yeah, a lot of it was just the capacity of the space we had because we also cook like prepare and cook and serve yeah. all of our own food every day and get donations from like have some budget for it and then get donations as well where is it located it's um hosted by brown university's environmental studies um building and, and we get funding through um like a super fund program at brown um so just in terms of the capacity like we decided it was better to have fewer students with more time together and more relationships built rather than playing the like nonprofit industrial complex numbers game of like bigger, 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 better, better, bigger, more, more. You know, like that's not yeah. the model we want. So it was it was really good this summer to scale back and basically cut the number of students in half, but have three times as much time over the week. So instead of, you know, each class was, you know, either two half days a week or one full day a week. So we only would really see people for, you know, six to eight hours a week in the previous summer, and then this past year, all, all the students were there three full days a week. Um, so it was much, much more time to really build and then also have time to all, you know, pile on a bus and yeah, go to the beach. Yeah, free time and, for like two hour free time. Yeah, so I played a lot of games, went on trips, you know, hikes and stuff like that. It was fun. Okay. 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 based on like a biotech topic basically so I thought this would be like a good idea to like help with my presentation my senior presentation yeah. and she's able to get school credit we're doing this new pilot program called the ELO which basically it's called what was it? expanded <laughs> learning opportunities yeah. um, where students can get school credit for stuff they do outside of school um, so yeah, we just started, we'll see how it goes. Um, we did, like, uh, one student was able to pilot it last year and successfully got credit. Um, and now we're growing, we have more people doing it this year. So we're just starting it all up. And uh, I'm sure you're gonna have an awesome presentation. It'll be good. Um, I started last, this summer. So a friend told me about the CEC program and I thought it was really interesting because I've always been, um, interested in like natural stuff and um, I even went vegetarian for a year um, so I got started with that and I wasn't I wasn't sure if I would like it but um, I ended up like loving it so now I do it in the school year and yeah so you do a lot of like pretty radical Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, like, just let's do it. It's like it's like like a teacher. Like when if you're ever in class and like this like there's always something. Like there's, always there's maybe supplies missing or a kid has like a mouth on them or. But we we did. I, I think we did it. We, hand, we handled yeah, it. Yeah, we handled it really good. 
They say Carissa yelled most of no, the I summer. Didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they say I don't Carissa. think I yelled. <laughs> I think I sang, yeah. but they said it was yelled. <laughs> In terms of, I think we've been lucky so far in that whole like always interface with like the funding world, and yeah. it's like oh, it's all about the mask, you know. So like, using those code words to make it sound like you know nice and liberal and all that kind of good stuff, you know, empowering and leadership development skills yeah. and you know all that kind of crap. And then in you know when you, when you really get down to it, you know, we're learning about you know corporations and white supremacy and you know, all these kind of issues, and um, I think it's really mind-opening for that, and it's, it's a really interesting process um, to see that kind of happen, and I think of all the, especially in the Revolution 101 class, we you know, got real in deep and heavy with a lot of the kind of, you know, topics, starting with, you know, oppression and then capitalism, and um, very early on we started noticing just, and I think this is something I'm still trying to find, we can do a lot better finding ways to really dive into, but I think of all of the different topics of isms, um, Racism and white supremacy was definitely the hardest mm -hmm. one to for people to really grasp and be on the same page with, and, and and especially the difference between discrimination and prejudice compared to racism. Um, and so, and I think it, it was it was interesting. I mean, CC students are predominantly all people of color. Um, there's always a few white students in the class too, and. That's the, that's kind of how the Providence schools look as well. Um, so I think a lot of people experience discrimination between different kind of groups, and as kind of the result of the divide and conquer types of things of you know um, just the, the infighting that comes out of that, and and have learned to call that racism, and have a really like, a harder time seeing things sis like systemically. Um, and so I think it was it was really successful this summer. I think we have a lot further to go with it, and I think there's. Um, I don't know. It's just it's it. I think there's been such a. The, the the definition of how we think about racism has gotten really skewed over the past couple of decades, and I think in terms of like you know the shutting down of the Black Power movement and the like assassinations and incarceration and, and living in this kind of like multicultural white supremacist era where, <coughs> you know, we we're told in school that you know racism is any kind of judgment of a person based on skin color. And then all of a sudden, then you know, then reverse racism is just as valid as racism is, you know, and like white people can be oppressed too, and all that kind of stuff. And even like myself as a white person and one of the teachers, like the only white teacher, um, it was it was really interesting that the conversations that came up in class and got it got real deep into it. It was it was good. And I, I think it's really really important to take the time to do that and realize that, you know, we've been throwing a lot around a lot of those words for like for years doing this work, you know, environmental justice, environmental racism. You know, talking about oppression and these things, and then we're like, wait a minute, we've never really gone into defining what these things are, um, and that work is really necessary before you can do anything else. Because other, if you're not, if you're using the same words but talking different conversations, um, and not really clearly understanding the situations we're living in and, and why they happen, and then how you're going to know how to what to do to address it. I know something that like I really like enjoyed about CC was that. In like our class, we would teach them about like what like what oppression is, and then like in the other classes, they would see how like oppression plays mm -hmm. out, like who it, who it affects and how it affects it. Like for the like for example, the food justice um, class, um, they got to see how like where the food is actually like how the food is actually distributed, where the food that's actually good for you is more in like wealthier neighborhoods, and where like the food that's actually that's not good for you that is cheap is in like urban neighborhoods. Um, and so that's something that I really did, like, how we, like, got to, like, kind of work with each other and, like, getting them in the sense of, like, who it's affecting and then, like, how it's affecting us and a, a question that I have for, I guess, mostly TSB, but kind of more, and anyone else who has, a st like, experience with co-ops and kind of, and, you know, with, with your starting is how to, how to get it off the ground and how to have it be, like, financially sustainable in terms of, like, money flow, and it's just, like, is that, is that you know, the big, the big question? And, how, like, basically, like, how to, how to be a functioning co-op in a capitalist world? Because it, and, you know, and, like, for the, the example of something we've run up against, like, we're not even done with our conversion yet. We're trying to figure out, okay, once we get it, then we got to start getting oil for it. We want to do it in these kind of ways, and, you know, restaurant, like, getting the waste oil, and, but, you know, veggie oil is becoming more and more of a thing, so what used to be, like, something that restaurants would pay people to get rid of, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they're like, oh no, we don't have to pay anybody, we can give it away for free, and now, you know, it's actually, a, there's there's worth to it, you know, and, and so, like, there is a very successful small business in Rhode Island called Newport Biodiesel 
that is, has been very successful at signing up lots of different restaurants to collect their oil and they've got the trucks to go around and pick it up and their facilities are all the way down in Newport. So they have their trucks pick up all the oil across Rhode Island, bring it down to Newport, process it and turn it into, um, into biodiesel and, and home, home heating oil. And um, you know, we have a tentative kind of partnership with them, but it, it's, it's tricky because they basically said like, yes, this is, this is what the partnership will look like. This is, this is your, you can take it or leave it. We, you can help us sign up more restaurants to Newport Biodiesel, where you go and help convince them to sign up to our programs, and then we'll set up a contract with them. We'll collect on these certain days. We'll set up the Newport Biodiesel barrel out there. We'll keep tabs of how much oil comes in from those restaurants. And then you can get, based on how much oil comes in from the ones that you signed up, we'll keep tabs of how much free veggie oil or biodiesel you will get as, like, as, as a give back. But you have to come down to Newport to pick it up, yeah. you know. And so, like in a bus that gets like eight miles a gallon, and, Newport and Newport's an hour, hour away. Yeah. Like, it, so they're trying to find ways that we can get it more locally. But they basically they, they, they told us like if you if if you try to sign up a restaurant to you just collect oil and it's one that they don't already have signed up and we're not signing up to their program, we're just getting it from them directly. Then they will view us as competition, and they're always trying to like you know compete against their competition mm -hmm. and if we approach a restaurant that is already signed up to them and ask them to just give us some directly that's considered theft because the oil is now the property of yeah. your poor biodiesel so there's not much solidarity there. no not at all so it's like and there's another like local business like th malloy which has been much more like they gave us 60 gallons of stuff and like you know newport biodiesel gave us an initial donation and so now we're trying to figure out, like, we want to set these things up, you know, we're not, we're so small, we're not established, we can't really guarantee to a restaurant, like, we'll be there all the time. And like Newport Bodies was saying, like, you know, we, 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 our reputation is dependent on, you know, restaurants know that they can depend on us to be there at the same time every week, that we are clean when we do it, we don't leave, we don't spill oil and leave it there, like, that, you know, we depend on that, and so we don't want other people that we don't necessarily have the same business standards and practice to mess up our reputation. And, so yeah, we're just trying to figure out like as we're kicking things off, like how do we how do we start? Where do we go with that? So what is um, the service that you actually want the co-op to provide? Like just renting the Yeah, I mean low I mean sliding scale transportation services. Um and it was I mean there's a whole other set of challenges with that. I mean I mentioned the insurance one, whether or not we can pay our drivers is another one. Um the type of I mean the the license that I need to get to drive this vehicle is like it's a very specific it's a class B CDL with two types of very specific endorsements that it's the same kind of type of license that a Ripta driver would have so right now there's only myself and my friend who's a bus driver for the city who can drive the bus um, so in terms of how much we're actually available to provide that is another thing you know busy schedules and all so it just it seems like there's so many hurdles to even start with that that is like yeah it's just easier to write a grant and try to like do some stuff on the side and do it that right. way rather than trying to create a whole new structure but the idea yeah. of it and being able to provide jobs and do yeah. you know we could do we can use this vehicle as a training vehicle for people who do want to get their CDL because that's a really hard like very expensive process yeah. um, and they could do it a lot cheaper through us so I don't know we're, 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 we're at the very beginning stages of like what, what could we do yeah. um, just in my like the very little experience that I've had in Catholic school busters, like the my, my very first introduction, it, and it's it's been so every, like every day that I've been there, we're always in a cash crunch. There's no there's no we're secure, you know. Mm -hmm. We 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 get money from grants and from the city, um, but we're I mean we're an organization that does um, free work that you know, and the youth have to get paid because it's a job. Um, and so it's like just so so difficult, um, of course, like to, to generate revenue or to um, you know really be sustained. And that's been like an uh, overriding uh, issue in, in the co-op, definitely. Um, uh, Asa knows a, a little bit more about like financial stuff, I'd say. In the co-op. Have you thought about like a, a way to make profit from it? I mean, like to yeah. so. I mean, yeah, we've been brainstorming for sure. Um, so, Toxic Soil Busters gets gets um, money from from the landscaping work that, that we do, the landscape landscaping, um, from the city or from the homeowner, depending on uh, whether or not they want to write a grant or pay us directly. Um, but, I mean, we're also like 
Worcester Roots Project is right now in the process of incubating a new co-op called The Diggers, uh, which is going to be a landscaping co-op. Um, it's going to be uh, for, like, to generate revenue. Um, and, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit more about what So, the first thing I understand about work cooperatives that Worcester's Project is currently incubating talks to so much as you can charge and control this media is that none of them are economically self-sustaining. They all make the majority of their funding comes from grants. Mm -hmm. So when you split up our budget, the biggest chunk is grant funded and then you have uh, donations, uh, individual donations that the individual co-ops are responsible for and then you have the funding we get for contracts we get from the city to do lead abatement work and um, contracts we get just from homeowners who do landscaping work, or in the case of Future Focus Media, uh, contracts that they have to do uh, photography and filming uh, contracts, as well as this year they're starting doing senior pictures, so that's mm. another source of revenue for them. Wedding photography kind of stuff too? Right, exactly. <laughs> Wedding photography. Yeah, that's, a, that's a cash cow for sure. But, so what we, the original conception of these cooperative talks to soil western to charge focus is more recent and probably the most stable right now.